And good evening, everyone. It's so nice to see all of you here. I'd like to remind you that IRIS is the Institute on Religion in an Age of Science, and that uh, is my credentials for being the moderator t tonight as a member of that uh, organization. Um, welcome to Cambridge Forum. Uh, this evening we have journalist and author uh, Larry Witham with us, and we will be discussing his new book, The Measure of God. Now, the Gifford Lectures were endowed by Adam Gifford in Scotland in 1887 to promote discussion and debate on science and all questions about man's conception of God and the infinite. Since Gifford's bequest, the lectures have become, as uh, Larry Witham has said, a window on a century in which natural science encountered biblical religion with full force. What our guest has done in his book is provide us with a fascinating review and analysis of the Gifford Lectures and introduce us to the thinking of some of the extraordinary speakers who have taken the opportunity to use the lectureship as a motivation to rethink their own ideas on materialism and the spiritual. People such as Albert Schweitzer, William James, Carl Sagan, and Iris Murdoch. The issues and ideas in Witham's book are especially relevant at a time um, when school districts are considering adding intelligent design to the biology curriculum and when the moral dilemmas of cloning and genetic testing are creating new challenges to conventional ethical principles. Larry has a couple of other books to his credit. One is uh, When Darwin Meets the Bible and also By Design, Science and the Search for God. He is a three-time winner of the uh, Wilbur Award of the Religion Communicators Council, um, and he has uh, received prizes from the Religion News Writers Association, and he is a, a recipient of the Templeton Foundation Award. So welcome to Cambridge Forum, Larry. Thank you. I'd especially like to thank Pat, um, who hosted me, and Jack for the introduction. Um, we have a big topic tonight, science and religion, and what I'm going to try to do is bring it down to earth a little bit. And if you think it's an intimidating topic, let me open with the trial that's happening now in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And you may have heard uh, Dover, Pennsylvania, a uh, small town in South Central State, decided to include or mention intelligent design in a statement read to students. It went to trial. So the first day of trial, what do they have? They have a biology teacher. And for two hours, with a PowerPoint, he gives a lesson in how evolutionary biology explains nature. And the judge, who the press corps thinks pretty much looks like Tom Hanks, if they ever make a movie about this, um, at the end of that session, he said, I'm inclined to say, Class dismissed for this morning. Later, well, the next day, they had a theologian. And uh, you, know, you have, you have d direct examination, and you have cross-examination, where they aggressively go at the credibility of the, the witness. And the, the theologian said, uh, in the Middle Ages, the uh, Jesuits and the Dominicans had a great debate about whether God knows the future. You know, and the judge is sitting there listening, and all, all the rest of the spectators. And he said, it got so furious that the Pope said, be still and stop talking about it. And the judge said, you know, that logic appeals to me. <laughs> so the attorney said, I'll move along quickly. So also, I will try to be brief and simple, 15 minutes, and then I'll be still. We like to think, as I was talking to Pat, that we can separate science and religion. Actually, my, my view is that most of us do in day-to-day in -day life and in uh, most other sectors. But in the real world, as we'll see in two cases, it invariably overlaps. And those two cases are going to be a tale of two cities. So we'll tell the story of Dover, Pennsylvania, ever so briefly. And I'll also tell the story of Edinburgh, Scotland, where the Giffords began. And then we'll look at um, what I propose is the ideal of separation or compartmentalizing 
but how invariably science and religion, God and science, uh, theology and science, you can all use all three, invariably overlap and in the real world uh, pose challenges to us. Uh, let's start with Dover. If you drove into Dover t today, you'd go up a hill and come to a little crossroad with a gas station, some old Victorian houses, a few old shops. You turn left, and there's the high school. About a 1,000 students. It's a small town. Uh, the park's across the street. The municipal building's right next door. And um, it's a small town. Two summers ago, they had to renew a biology textbook. And one member of the board said that the current book, which is very popular, was, quote, laced with Darwinism. And this, this head of the curriculum section on the board attended a conservative evangelical church. So already you can see the story, it's kind of from central casting, right? The, the religious conservative on the board questions Darwinism and everything begins. So uh, there's a board debate. The faculty don't like any changes. In fact, um, the faculty have never taught origins because that's not even in the state science standards, which otherwise have very high recommendation from, from scientists. Um, and in the past, a faculty for the freshman biology class stood up and said, uh, there is a debate on origins, but you should talk to your parents and your, your friends about that. We're going to look at just the science. So they'd been doing this for years. But the deb board debate arose, the faculty um, protested, and a board member said, well, then let's put a book about intelligent design in the library. If we're not going to get a book that has creation and evolution in it, put one in the library. It's called Of Pandas and People. And it's like a, a supplementary text for grade school. And the, the faculty said, fine. But then the faculty said, well, what, what do we say then about these books? So the board wrote up a statement. And uh, basically, it's, it's a sort of statement that's called the classic disclaimer. Now, sometimes they put, put this in a textbook. So when kids take the biology textbook home, they can see there that because Darwin's, th Darwin's theory is a theory, it continues to be tested as new evidence is discovered. The theory is not a fact. Gaps in the theory exist, et cetera, et cetera. This is the typical disclaimer. What was new in Dover and why it's a, a national to-do and why it went to court is that it said, um, intelligent design is an explanation of the origin of life that differs from Darwin's view. The reference book of pandas and people is available in the library along with other resources for students who might be interested, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the faculty didn't like this either, but they would prefer to read a statement that the administration approved and the lawyer approved and the board approved than go in themselves and be, you know, the culprit in this. Um, well, it, it, uh, it worked until uh, the major legal groups found out about it. Well, let me, let me mention what intelligent design is and why there's a debate. Its critics, of course, in, in the trial and elsewhere call it intelligent design creationism. They argue that it's just the most recent form, a form of scientific argument that goes way back to the creation science debates in the 80s and even as far back as the Scopes trial when they outlawed the teaching of uh, human evolution. The, the advocates of intelligent design, and the reason it's gotten this far, is that it doesn't speak about the Bible. It doesn't, it doesn't mention a particular deity. Um, it doesn't uh, mention some of the old factors of creation science. It just says that biological life is so complex that Darwinian evolution by natural selection on random mutation cannot explain that complexity. Um, there are hundreds of scientists who say, That's okay. that sounds OK to me. We don't have to um, say who the designer is or where the intelligence came from. But of course, there are hundreds of thousands of scientists through their organized bodies who say, no, that's creationism. So that's the dispute. The, uh, the school board in Dover is, is persuaded that the book, and, and just this word that's read, it's read it's four paragraphs. It takes one minute to read it before the biology class, and then nothing more is said in the, in the curriculum. But that one statement, intelligent design, read to the class, is enough to alarm some that religion has been put in the classroom. So the ACLU and other groups, they've actually been looking for a case like this for years because uh, the intelligent design movement is, is gaining steam. 
They found parents and teachers who would uh, sue the school board, and the sue went, uh, suit went forward in December. Um, trial began on uh, October 26, and as we speak tonight, they have testimony beginning tomorrow morning, an another two weeks of it. So we don't know what the judge is going to say. Um, the issue here is, is probably more church-state than science-science, two views of science, because the ACLU says, uh, and the courts have said, the Supreme Court has said, you can't establish religion in a government institution like a public school. Uh, you can't teach a creation theory because you're teaching a kind of biblical religion. That's the ACLU's argument. Uh, the defense, which has a, um, a private um, public uh, law firm helping them, and they're, they're, Christian, they're a Christian activist law firm. So again, you see it's, it's sort of um, from gen, um, central casting again, the ACLU versus the conservative uh, Christian. They, they happen to be Catholics, the, this law firm, in their background. But they're in, uh, doing battle in court, and they say, Mentioning intelligent design in one word, in one minute, and telling the kids there's a book in the library isn't you know, imposing religion on the minds of these you know, um, uh, nubile young people. Um, it's freedom of learning. And in fact, there's enough uh, science in it that you could call it science. What's the big deal? And so, as the judge said the other day when I was in the courtroom, okay, I understand. The ACLU, you say they're teaching intelligent design. The school board says they're not teaching intelligent design. They're just mentioning it. So the, the, that has to be resolved. I, I predict that the judge will rule narrowly. He'll say, in this case, in Dover is what I'm ruling on. And he may break it up, and he may say, you can't mention intelligent design because obviously the board had religious motives when they put together this, this um, policy. But you could probably have the book in the um, library. Well, you know, that's, uh, that seems pretty uh, liberal education oriented. And he may say something else. He may say, and what I'm ruling about is just this case. It doesn't apply to anything else the higher courts have said. Well, uh, that's to be seen. As much as I like Dover, it was a beautiful fall season when I visited there, um, Edinburgh is a great place to visit. Has anyone been there? Well, in general, Scotland has this feature called the crag and tail. It's a big volcanic rocky mountain that comes up, and there's a long tail. All the castles are on the crags, and Edinburgh was built on such a crag. So it's got a castle on the top. It's got these old uh, stone Victorian buildings, and um, that's Old Town. Uh, David Hume was born up there th three or 400 years ago. Um, the, the Scottish um, awakening, all the intellectuals of that period uh, took place there. And in, um, in the 1800s, a young man named Adam Gifford grew up on those streets, the son of a town council member. He became a lawyer. He became wealthy. And when he died in 1887, he endowed $5 million for the Gifford Lectures in Natural Theology. Now, they call it Natural Theology. He didn't give it that title, but essentially... I'll define that at this point. Natural theology is the attempt to use science, reason, or human experience to then logically go up and talk about God. You know, what is the nature of God? Does God exist? And you may know Hume said it doesn't work, you know, the famous uh, Scottish skeptic. Well, um, Gifford, he was raised a, a strict Presbyterian, but he was a free thinker. And he... he um, you might be surprised to hear that his endowing of the lectures is very similar to the reason that the school board in Dover um, applied this policy for the students. He lived in the late Victorian period when, uh, when philosophical materialism was gaining ground. And uh, church attendance, there were these, some revivals there but, uh, in Scotland, but basically church attendance was declining. And he thought, well, with, in, in this Victorian age when they believed in progress and that knowledge would resolve science and religion conflicts, he said, let's have lectures for the general public that um, uses science to perhaps prove that God exists and, and, and how to live a good life. So his concern was not too different from this little school board in Dover. Well, the story of the Giffords is very long and complex, and... Uh, uh, that's, that's what I wrote about in this book. 
uh, trying to put 117 years with the 220 speakers into, into one narrative. And uh, if you'll see that um, it's not only evolution and creation they raised, but uh, the question of anthropology as a science and what that says about Christian belief. Uh, the debates between the great philosophies of early in the century, idealism and materialism. Um, so, uh, sociology came of age 100 years ago and began to try to explain society as a science rather than as a, a divine kind of creation. And so we go through the sciences and we look at the lectures up to the present. Um, in fact, if you look in the appendix, uh, you'll see uh, what, what a remarkable, well, the reason the story is worth telling, at least as a journalist when I came upon it, is the remarkable list of people who've, uh, who've given the lectures. And Pat mentioned a few, um, but Frederick Max Mueller, who was one of the first ones, he gave the keynote at the Parliament of World Religions. And some of you may have heard about that in 1893. That was the big you know, arrival of world religions in the United States. So he, we don't know him now, but he was a big name then. William James, uh, Henri, Henri Bergson, uh, Arthur Eddington, the great uh, uh, physicist early in the century, John Dewey, the educator, um, uh, Whitehead, I forget his first name now, but uh, um, the founder of Process Thought, uh, North Whitehead, Albert Schweitzer, Karl Barth, Paul Tillich, Reinhold Niebuhr, Arnold Toynbee, eight Nobel laureates gave it. Did they find a solution to um, science and religion? No. In fact, um, the Giffords have been called the, the Nobel Prize of, of uh, philosophy and theology, but they don't propose a solution. They allow you know, all kinds of ideas to come through, and the result is um, one person called it a... Um, a great museum of intellectual conflict. So in the Giffords and in Dover, we have a problem reconciling religion. They won't stay separate. And, but the, the effort is to inform a, a different publics. The, the Dover board is trying to inform students if they don't learn about it at home. And uh, that may be a valid uh, a goal and purpose, but it, it creates a church-state problem. The Giffords were supposed to be a popular lecture, like the Cambridge Forum, before they had a broadcast. And uh, Lord Gifford imagined university students attending, but also the general public and uh, you know, uh, professionals after work to cultivate uh, their knowledge of religion and science. Well, the problem is this is a very complicated topic. In school, and I've, I've done some writing on this, it's almost impossible to decide where do you raise this topic. If it's in science class, very controversial, and that's what's in court. If you do it in social studies, the teachers are nervous about teaching it because they're not trained in it. Always af afraid that um, uh, parents or students would be offended or, or someone might sue. The Giffords have a problem also. And it was the problem I had in, in writing this book is how to boil down all this complexity, in this case in 300 pages and in, in one storyline. The Giffords were supposed to be a popular lecture, but be, because they became based at the four historic universities in Scotland, they did become somewhat elite. Very top scholars give them, and so it's very hard for ordinary people often to understand them. So in life, we keep religion and science separate, but so often it overlaps. In, uh, if you go to, to uh, Edinburgh, one of the, the, the most beautiful sites there is Waverley Station. And this was built just about the time Gifford was in his last days. It was a great Victorian train station um, with iron ribs and 13 acres of glass over the, the trains and the rails. And there's a story in Scotland about the country woman up in the highlands or in a, in a fishing village. She worked and saved her whole life to take the train in and finally see the big city. So she goes that morning, all her friends see her off, and she arrives at Waverley Station. And she's just amazed. And she spends the day there, gets on the train, goes back to her village, and when, when she arrives, all her friends gather around and say, what was it like? What was the big city like? And she said, it was just amazing. 
The whole city was covered with glass. Well, in science and religion, sometimes if I can empathize with this uh, Scottish woman. We only see a small part of a big universe and think that we've, we've seen it all. So I'm not, uh, in my talk, in my book, I'm not proposing an answer, but um, to conclude, uh, I predict this debate will continue uh, in school boards and in universities and in the Gifford Lectures. Uh, the, the lawyers for the defendants, who are the school board, want this to go to the Supreme Court. And that's why in the trial testimony they're laying out all this excruciating detail about biology and theology and what school board members said what. So if this goes up to the courts, there's, there's a record there. And finally, the Supreme Court justices might rule, is intelligent design science or religion? Or can school boards decide about it? It's, uh, it's unlikely it'll go that far, but the, the debate's not over. And next year, if you get to Edinburgh, um, the leading paleontologist, who's a, a fossil expert from Cambridge University, is giving the Giffords uh, in Edinburgh. And his name is uh, Simon Conway Morris. And he will argue that uh, the evolution of body forms shows purpose and direction in the universe. It almost sounds like intelligent design. Thank you very much. Well, I get the chance to ask the first question here. So I would like to ask Larry, what do you, from, uh, from your experience in writing this book and seeing all of these lectures, what do you see as the primary issues between science and religion as of present time? I think, um, I think basically two. One is the definition of science. And this, is, this troubles scientists to no end because since the medieval times we've been working on it to say that science is only natural causes and only what they call methodological naturalism. You can only do physical tests to, to do things. Well, through the Gifford Lectures, a lot of scientists and certainly a lot of people in humanities have challenged that because they look at how some of the medieval scientists had bizarre theories and found out a, a physical truth. Uh, some scientists had dreams. Uh, Newton tried to figure out the book of Revelation of all things while he developed the three laws of mechanics that has not been refuted since. So there's one thing. The other thing is if you posit there, that there's a God, and, and basically the, the Giffords have been about monotheism, um, how does God interact with the physical world? And there's all kinds of solutions, but that's the second big um, question that they've uh, addressed mm -hmm. often. Well, I have to uh, pause now to tell the radio audience that you are listening to us at the Cambridge Forum, listening to Larry Witham discussing the measure of God, can we reconcile science and religion? And now, um, does anyone in the audience have a burning question? Yes, would you come up to the microphone, please? <laughs> I've been reading voraciously about this topic, and one thing I've come across in a lot of editorials is that it, they're easy to reconcile um, intelligent design and evolution because intelligent design answers the how and the intelligent design answers the why. And the, a lot of people think that's not a conflict, but there, everyone seems to have a different take on this. Mm -hmm. But is that... A lot of, have you heard that also? You know, that's a very good definition, and it came out in trial testimony. You know, there's about this much testimony, but if someone can boil it down to a little book, it'll be worth reading someday. Um, that argument is that science is the how, how things work. Religion is the why, and they, they don't overlap, so there's no conflict. And, uh, but also in trial testimony and also in the Giffords, um, it is often argued, yeah, but science, you know, often tells us why. Um, science, some scientists say uh, the universe is meaningless. Um, that's a why. Uh, some scientists say that um, conservative politics is good or liberal politics is good. 
um, et cetera, et cetera. But when they're saying that, are they doing science? Well, and um, they say, which hat do they have on? And yeah. you'll hear a scientist say, I don't have my science hat on now. I have my you know, private citizen, philosopher, you know, say what you want hat. But um, there's the overlap. You know, how do you divide up uh, an individual scientist? I, I had the pleasure of interviewing Carl Sagan once. I'm very familiar with his work, and he's on our reading list here. But he was a, um, he's, even his colleagues in hard scientists, science said he advanced science education, but he also espoused scientism, which is the philosophy that you know, science is the only answer to everything, <laughs> our moral dilemmas, the origin of the universe. And um, some scientists who happen to believe in God or are Christians or Jewish or otherwise uh, would differ with, with that science. So how and why, good, but they're always overlapping. Well, uh, there's a problem here. Uh, you, in, the, in the book you have written, you have been uh, taking religion to be, mean essentially the, the um, deistic religions of the Western culture. And uh, however, their religion is much wider than that. Uh, their Eastern religions and, and other forms which do not require a uh, deistic doctrine. Um, how do you reconcile those with your discussion? Well, coming to the Gifford topic, you, ha you have to work with the history of it. He came out of you know, that Western culture, uh, Presbyterian, Judeo-Christian. Um, eventually in the book, I do a chapter on um, religious pluralism, which I argue you know, after the 60s becomes a new challenge to knowledge in, in our Western society. Not only do we read about Buddhism and Hinduism, which are either you know, atheistic or, or um, polytheistic or you know, what you may call them. Now they're moving into our neighborhoods. And there's a big mosque in Edinburgh now, and um, et cetera, et cetera. So the Giffords deal with the question of world religions through the question of religious pluralism. Um, if there are so many truth claims made about religion, how can you be confident that yours is true? And this is a dilemma of knowledge. It kind of hinges on science because uh, some say if, if uh, Buddhists and Christians and um, Hindus, for example, can agree on certain scientific aspects of the universe, laws and principles and patterns, maybe they can agree through natural theology to go back and say, well, you know, the, co the ultimate reality gives order to the universe. You, you, Buddhism may call that the nothingness. Christianity may call it God. But um, we can agree that there's some ultimate reality in common. There's a, some of that solution is being worked out. Okay. Um, let me turn to the audience again, see if uh, there are some. Yes. Right. Please come up to the microphone. As you were recounting your stories, I thought of one that I thought you might enjoy. Uh, my son has a degree in evolutionary biology, and I went with him to um, a sort of convention of evolutionary biologists where faculty and students had posters of their various research mm -hmm. projects, and I was milling among one, and here was one from the University of Utah. And it occurred to me, well, Utah most of the people attending the public university in Utah are probably Mormons, and Mormons don't believe in evolution, strongly don't believe in it. So I asked the uh, professor there, uh, how do your students reconcile their graduate work in evolutionary biology with their, with their religious beliefs? And she sort of smiled and said, well, that's for Sunday and for family, and you do that when you need to. And then when you're in university, you do what you need to do there. And it's no problem. You shift from one to the other. I, I found that a little troubling because I kind of like to integrate things, but I thought you might yeah. enjoy that. Again, uh, we all comp compartmentalize. Um, it's complicated. Um, in the 1930s, the, the Mormon... Um, leadership issued a statement saying they have no problem with evolution. That's for scientists. We're dealing with divine revelations of our faith. Um, with the rise of creationism in mid-century, a lot of young Mormon uh, youth are influenced by the sort of Bible creationism of the, of the evangelicals. 
So they're taking that into school. And I, I even interviewed the, um, the current president of the Mormon Church once, and he says, doesn't bother me at all. That's for scientists. And so he, oh, he, he separates, yeah. too. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yes, on campus, the young people are caught up in the whole thing, and the, the science faculty are challenged. You know, how there's this youthful enthusiasm in America, apparently, in some of these sectors, to uh, find out how God works in nature. Um, the, if a young person um, is raised that way, even in college, they don't want to hear, no, no, there's absolutely no way that God can touch nature. Absolutely off limits. And um, faculty don't like to come down with that hammer, but that's what science, in effect, says. So they're looking for, you know, middle ground to, to either not address it or integrate it somehow, you know. Um, college, it's easier than in high school, because in high school you have the big church-state problems. But it's, yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah, my, my own thought is that uh, we tend to think of God as up coming down. And maybe it's more down coming up. To a certain extent, we create God and religious beliefs, which then become very real in the sense of, uh, to draw a secular parallel, the famous letter about, yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus. Yes. Santa Claus is very real to children, and God is very real to adults, but that doesn't mean it's a dictating or creation-oriented God, just a thought. Mm -hmm. Uh, I might say uh, one theme in the Giffords that often comes up is the idea of emergence, that even God emerges out of the the physical universe, or the mind emerges out of biology. Well, I would say that religion emerges out of the human uh, experience, culture. yes, it's right. And, experience. and and then once it emerges, does it take an independent reality of its own such that you call it a real thing? Or is it just a fantasy? Ah, that's and that's, an interesting that's the big question. debate. <laughs> okay, do we have some more comments from the audience? Yes. Um, going back to your uh, comment about truth and religion, Errol, Errol Morris uh, was talking, um, you know, the documentary filmmaker, um, a few months ago, and he came to the climax of this talk and he shared a quote uh, with the audience. And he said, as a logical matter, not, there's no way all of the world's religions can be right, but they could all be wrong. <laughs> and the audience was stunned yes. because it's a brilliant piece of uh, logic, logic <laughs> yeah. that can't be argued with. And so my question to you is, uh, I mean, we're, you know, we're in Cambridge and the Puritans were here and, you know, a signpost of their, of their, of their whole religion was the, the, the intense rationality with which they tried to work out the, you know, the calculus of their own salvation. And this, this, the whole notion of, of, of linear reasoning and causality within religion, where everything has got to be worked out, cause and effect, almost as if it were a science, doesn't it kind of belie a certain um, a mismatch of in, in instinct and intuition? Yes. Uh, the Puritans have often been called scholastics. In other words, they picked up from the medieval theologians A equals B and B equals C, so A equals C, and therefore God exists. And there's a certain quality of that in, in natural theology, too. Uh, the English had natural theology and William Paley and the Bridgewater treatises where brilliant scientists said this evidence in the world points to uh, a creator. Um, as the gentleman there with the uh, cell phone problem said, <laughs> um, a, lot of pe- a lot of religionists over this whole century have questioned that. Question, you know, is, is, does religion need this kind of imitation science or rationality? Because religion is really intuition, or as Karl Barth would say, as he did in his Gifford lectures, no, uh, humanity can't know anything about the transcendent God. God breaks into this world with a revelation. That's all we know about God. So natural reason doesn't help us at all. Uh, To conclude on on this point, in the Giffords, there has been a, um, a revival of science and religion by saying science, the natural world is getting softer. We have quantum theory at the atomic level. You know, you can't quite pin down the hard edge of matter. We have chaos theory in, in systems. And as nature softens up, then they think, well, maybe the mind of God is in there somewhere. You don't have to be logical. Uh, you can be a person of faith or intuition. And theories of science 
don't lock out God for you if, you, if you worry about that problem. You know, religion is mostly about how you live and these kind of things, but if you have the problem of understanding where God works in nature, nature softening up, and uh, more new, intuitive, some say New Age, but even some of the Orthodox Christian groups are looking for these doorways into nature. Um, so I hope that speaks to that. Okay, please. Um. Hi. Um, when I was a kid, my parents used to tell me, um, don't, don't lie to us now because we're going to find out the truth anyway. <laughs> like, whether you tell us or not, like, it's going to come out. Um, they used to say that they had this bird that would tell them um, everything that we did. And so they pretty much scared the pants off me. And so I always told them the truth anyway. Um, currently, I'm an educator, and we try to instill into our students um, the thought processes that will allow them to think critically about what is true and what's not. Um, we want them to be able to take all the facts and evidence presented before them and analyze it themselves instead of the educators telling them what to believe. Okay. Um, my my question is just like, what are your thoughts on on how like scientists want to present truth, like with with all the facts and evidence that they feel they have before them, um, and how they feel what I perceive as you know they feel threatened by this proposal that maybe intelligent design has something else to offer beyond what they've proposed. You know, because my thinking is, like, if it's truth, like with a capital T, if it's really truth, like, it's going to win out in the end. And don't we want our students to know, or, or, you know, learners, don't we want people to be able to, you know, see all the options on the table and assess for themselves what is really truth? Um, so why would they feel threatened by that? A very, very good question. Um, it's different in high school where we have a sort of a um, you know, social responsibility for young, impressionable people, and college where you can um, have a knock-down, drag-out debate with the, the university professor. Uh, the feeling of scientists in high school is that um, don't confuse the students. Teach them mainline conventional science because it teaches them critical thinking faculties. That's, that's what the scientists claim. And America needs science-minded young people, or we're going to sink. We're not going to compete in the world economy. In the, again, I, I try to keep my own opinions out of this because they're often not clear, but in the trial, they had an expert on uh, teaching biology from McGill University. And he did some studies, and his testimony is if you... Um, he was very pro-science, teaching the straight science. If you say we're going to study evolution today, but there's another theory called intelligent design or, you know, creationism, um, but we're not going to go into that, but talk about that with your family or look at another book. He says that will trouble students um, who will think that what they're learning in evolution means they can't have their religion that their parents give them. He said it sets up a conflict in those students. Sort of the corollary to that is, well, then don't even raise it for the students so they don't know about the science-religion debate. And, that, you know, I, I interviewed some high school kids in Dover. They, they don't understand the biology anyway. I did when I was in high school. <laughs> but uh, don't raise any prickly questions and just hope the science-minded young people catch on and go into science like that. Now, there's another theory I'm going on here, but that... Uh, if you teach them a debate in science, then they understand how to separate the facts from the theory. Oh, there's a theory underlying Darwinian um, uh, facts in biology, and that is that you know, the, the, um, there's law and chance in the universe and things are random. You can't have intelligence in nature. Uh, there's, a, there's a presumption there. And so these people who are often you know, on the creation side or favor the debate say students will lighten up to, brighten up to science and really try to figure out the puzzle. Well, is it God or is it just nature? So you have a complete disagreement on two sides, and we don't have any definitive studies on which makes better students. Okay, I think way in back, first, the lady who's, uh, had her hand up before. So. Hi. Um, 
So one of the essential questions you proposed in today's lecture was whether we could reconcile science and religion. And so I was wondering what you thought about the contention that in modern society today, science has kind of become the new religion or the secular religion. And um, if it has, then in looking at the role science plays in this society, do you feel like you have to treat his science or the history of science differently as, say, like the history of truth and um, distinctly um, different from, say, like the history of England or the history of the French Revolution or something like that? Very good question. How old are you, young lady? Um, I'm 19. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that that sounded like a 19-year-old uh, question. That's very good. Um, we do live in a scientific society. Science is probably the most kind of reliable knowledge that we have. And scientists will often say, you can go anywhere in the world, Rio de Janeiro or London, do the same experiment, do the same math, and we can all agree. It's like a universal knowledge or religion. If you go to India and you go to the um, United States, uh, you can't agree on what God is. So science is superior in that way. And that's, that's a logical argument. Um, but you get into scientism and you get into the fact that our society, even though people are a little bit afraid of science, uh, they basically want all the bells and whistles that science can give us. So science is sort of taking over everything. I walked around Harvard today, and it's, um, you know, the divinity schools shrinking over here, and the science buildings are growing over there. And uh, it's the same in every campus. So science is this overwhelming force. Um, however, um, so the religious people can... can can deal with that as they may, and they found many good ways to do it. However, they're academics now called historians of science, as you pointed out. And they argue that scientists, uh, you know, create fantasies just like the rest of us. And if you look at the history of science, um, you'll see that uh, scientists have vested interests. They want to be the sort of the, um, the cultural shapers. Uh, they will do things to exclude theology. Uh, they want the government money. Money. You can't. Uh, theological seminary can't get government funds. But uh, all all the science in, in Cambridge here, you know, most of it's funded by taxpayer government dollars. So there's a social struggle there. Who who will define reality for us? And uh, to conclude, in the Dover trial, uh, the school board's going to have a, an expert witness who teaches in England, who's a historian of science. And he'll argue that that's exactly what's going on. The, quote, Darwinian establishment is so threatened by this little intelligent design group, they will do anything, you know, throw millions of dollars at it, throw lawsuits at it, to shut it down, uh, not because it will topple their establishment, but it embarrasses them, because it does raise problems in their science. Uh, it points out problems in their textbooks. And... Uh, you know, I, I reported in Washington, D.C. for a number of years, and if an administration or a party was embarrassed, they would just try to shut down the opposition. So the same with science. And I'm not dis belittling scientists themselves or the great enterprise, but it, it is an establishment, and uh, that may, may be part of this, uh, this, this uh, dispute in Dover. Uh, yes, in the green aqua, aqua uh, T-shirt or whatever. Hi, I'm uh, getting ready in the fall to do a program at the Divinity School and, um, and at the medical school, so I, I go back and forth on a lot of these questions, too. Um, my um, uh, usual experience is um, uh, kind of the obverse, I guess. I think I'm using the right word, as um, what one of the other questioners uh, mentioned. Um, so my question usually is, why are Christians so threatened with something that actually investigates something? Um, I'd like to tell a brief story and then ask a question. Um, when I used to live in uh, Kentucky, I had graduated. I li when I lived in Kentucky uh, most recently, which is where I grew up, um, I had graduated um, from Harvard with a degree in evolutionary biology. So I was talking to a gentleman who was, uh, went to Asbury Theological yes. Seminary that uh, William F. Buckley said was the greatest de defense against modernity in the planet. So we were talking, and um, he was surprised that he kind of uh, didn't hate me, and I was surprised I kind of didn't hate him. So we were. Um, so he said, "Well, you know, I hadn't told him I'd gone to Harvard." 
and he said, well, you know, at Harvard, they don't even teach evolutionary biology anymore. And this was about um, probably 14 years ago. I said, so Stephen Jay Gould doesn't teach there, does he? He said, no. And I said, well, who is Stephen Jay Gould? He said, well, I don't know. And I said, so he doesn't teach at Harvard. And no one would ever mention evolutionary biology at Harvard anymore. And he said, no, they wouldn't, because it's been completely discounted. Mm -hmm. um, and I said, well, Stephen Jay Gould's the, um, they, you know, you could kind of say he's the Darwin of today, and he does teach. And they talk about it a lot. And, um, and he, j he told me that he was just amazed that I would lie like that uh, just to try to um, uh, prove that uh, it was worth investigating those sorts of things. Yes. Um, your story is not uncommon. It's okay, when we separate religion and science, we call it compartmentalizing. But in this debate, there's a lot of blinkers and blinders, too. And uh, I think. Uh, to, to, uh, to make plausible any particular worldview, especially you know, a religious one that's challenged by modernity, uh, folks block out what science is telling them. What intrigues me is the people who, uh, and you'll meet a lot of these people as you do your program, is they say, well, this is, this, this is my leap of faith, and I'm going to try to hold on to this, and then I'm going to go headlong into science and, you know, mix it up and see what I can resolve and um, may the best man win. And may I keep my faith in the process. Okay, there was a question here. Um, one of the interesting things that comes across to me that, and I haven't read your book, that you're putting, uh, telling us is that uh, maybe one of the problems that we're having is that there's too much emphasis on who's going to win in this situation, and perhaps it is something where, you know, maybe there isn't enough knowledge to win yet, or maybe, in fact, nobody will ever win. But the thing that uh, has been uh, coming at us, I think, from the news a lot, are what may be simplistic explanations of what the different positions are. And what I'm curious about is, can you give us a pretty good uh, explanation of what this theory of intelligent design specifically says, and two, why do people who promote this theory seem to claim, and this is just what I seem to have heard in the news and so on, seem to claim that there's no conflict between intelligent design and science. <clears throat> it's um, it's complicated. Uh, the Gifford lectures are about natural theology. Uh, natural theology was born out of the idea that look at all these amazing wonders. The planets move around each other without exploding. You know, um, you know, trees give shade to flowers and flowers give food to animals. And this is all the sign of some beneficent and wise being. Well, science began to show that no... Um, you know, natural selection produces trees and flowers. You know, the, the flowers that can survive stay under the tree, and the, the animals who can get the flowers, um, they multiply, and that's why we have the, the diversity in life. And Darwin discovered this. He said the, the mechanism for all this, absolutely everything, is natural selection. <laughs> In the last 30 or 40 years, well, when Darwin looked at the cell, it was a little blob. He just thought it was a little blob of protoplasm that somehow they hadn't understood life and DNA and all that yet. Um, but in recent decades, they've got electron microscopes, and they can go in and look at the cell. And even the scientists, even the atheist scientists, even the science organizations say the cell is filled with tiny machinery, conveyor belts, you know, production uh, wheels, um, you know, uh, tr uh, things that design and produce. And the intelligent design people say, okay, so you've called it machinery. Machinery is usually designed. Okay, so that's their first point. The evolutionists say, well, it evolved there. You know, one piece fell into place and it survived, another piece fell into place, another piece fell into place, and those that didn't have a purpose, they withered away. And eventually, over millions of years, you have this, uh, the favorite, the flagellum, the little, you know, 50-part machine on a cell, or you have blood clotting, which is a cascade of about 20 
chain of things before the blood just stops flowing. And the intelligent design, people say, as a scientific question, natural selection can explain how those complex entities came into being. And they say there's actually zero scientific papers on it. There's, there's theories on it and articles on it, but no one's shown. So that is a scientific question, and the scientists will admit that. And they say, well, then what's the alternative? How did that machinery get there? And they said, well, it looks like someone intelligent put it there. Aha, so you're talking about God, right? And then the intelligent design people say, we don't have to say who, what the intelligence is. It looks like it's designed. You know, we looked at all the physical pieces, and our theory is that it's designed. It didn't evolve. Yes, I happen to believe it's God, but that's when I'm wearing my, you know, private citizen hat. But as a scientist, I think it's just, so this is what they're trying to wedge into science to debate um, and for the adult scientists and the university scientists, this is actually a big row. It's a big controversy. But when you get into high schools, it looks very much like a religious movement is trying to teach them that God made all that complexity. And we haven't seen the end of the debate in, in, the, in the academy. Um, and it's a church-state debate so far in, in the school. Was that at all clear, why they say it's science? Oh, now we have a whole bunch of questions, and we're coming to the end of our time. But I think you were first. Well, I was impressed recently in the New England Journal of Medicine that uh, there was sort of a, a rant against intelligent design, and they made a rather good debating point that if, uh, if God or this designer designed the cascade of coagulation, he should have done a better job because it has all these defects that lead to bleeding <laughs> disorders and Not blood a clots and so on. Right. Okay. Yeah. I'm glad he brought that up. I was just going to say um, I've had the opportunity to be a teacher, a science teacher for junior high and high school. Um, I'm now a, new, a young scientist. I'm a, a neurologist. I do clinical science and, and research. But I'm also the mother of a teenager. So I'll share my experience with you as a, as a teacher, as a science teacher. I thought it was important to, to tell the students, um, yes, there is the Big Bang theory, and there is also the theory of creation, and this is what people believe, and this is what this theory is all about. As a scientist, I can tell you that science has a lot of flaws, and we're constantly retracting and saying, well, we were wrong about this. And a lot of the times when you read these articles, they're so inconclusive. Because, yes, truly, it is so difficult to figure out how the body works or how the mind works, etc. So that has a lot of flaws. And as a mother of a teenager, I was very pleased to see that he was being taught the uh, Judaism and um, all the different religions, and he had to learn about them, and he had to explain them to me. And I thought that was very good. And he's, you know, he's now rethinking what religion is all about. And, and it scares me because I believe in God, but I think it's important for him to realize that. And sometimes I wonder, um, what draws these people to sue? Is it that they, they feel threatened? Is it that they don't want their kids to be exposed to other things? And why? Because they cannot accept that the world is made out of you know, different um, religions or different cultures. And I think that it is sad that we have gotten to this, and it's very, very important that the students are exposed to it in a good way. Thank you. And I'd like to comment on the, uh, there's lots of clever variations on that. If God's the designer, he, he didn't design this very well. And uh, um, you'll hear that, you hear that in trial, and you hear that a lot. And it's, it's a good rebuttal. And there's a book on that that says, well, it depends on what kind of God you want. You know, if you want a God who tinkers, makes things perfect here, but, you know, unusual there. Um, I think there are too many lawsuits in our society, but who am I? And uh, you have legal action groups, as the gentleman here suggested, um, and they want to win. It's a culture war thing. The ACLU, Americans United for Separation of Church and State, National Center for Science Education, they watch the newspapers every day for school districts where this, the head pops up. And as in Dover, they looked at it and said, we've got a trial record. We have, we have a record of what the board said, this and that. Let's do a lawsuit. To, start, to nip this in the bud. A lot of school boards are doing this, but nobody hears about it, so they don't get lost. Or there's enough consensus in the community that they, um, as you seem to be, you, you like 
a very open approach to it. So you would never sue if this were happening in your school. But um, I don't see anything wrong with it, but um, invariably someone's going to sue and someone's going to defend. And um, that scares schools from experimenting on good ways to do it. Okay, I'm going to offer Larry a chance to make a final statement or word to the audience. Oh, you have time for one more question? Well, was there one here also? Uh, I'm okay. doing fine. Go ahead. Okay, fine. Terrific. You're improving on my little talk a lot, so please. Um, I'm, I'm going to the subtitle of your book, Reconciling Science and Religion. Something like that, yeah. right? Our century-long struggle to reconcile. <laughs> like oh, so this is maybe a simple-minded question, but when you think of the scientific explanation of the beginning of life, you know, there's the Big Bang Theory and then the little uncelled animals, plants eventually appear and develop and so forth, versus the Garden of Eden, it's pretty different explanations. There certainly are scientists and very prominent scientists who have... Um, who have religious beliefs. I think progressive Christians, at any rate, uh, believe the Bible is metaphor, period. You know, they don't, they don't take it literally. But I wonder if you could just give us an idea of, a, say, a scientist's version of religious faith. Yes, well, um, uh, I had the opportunity with a colleague of mine, uh, Professor Ed Larson, to survey scientists in the, in the late 1990s. We surveyed members of American men and women of science, and we surveyed natural scientists in the National Academy of Scientists. And we found that 40% of ranking scientists, we call them, believe in a fairly traditional God who you can pray to expecting an answer to your prayer. So 40%, a lot of scientists were shocked, you know. Um, but you do find on the spectrum uh, more scientists uh, tend to adopt the spiritual if it's seen as an emergent property out of nature or if the spiritual is a mystery beyond nature um, or if the spiritual is ethics. You'll find, and frankly, there are more scientists that come out of certain denominations. Now, I don't want to put labels on things, but a lot of Unitarians are scientists, a lot of... Uh, United Congregationalists are scientists, Episcopalians, uh, fewer Baptists. Uh, you know, you can, you can study it socially. Um, when we, when we, we surveyed the National Academy of Sciences, however, um, guess how many biologists think that God exists? 5%. So 95% are, you know, in, in, by implication, atheists. These are the top scientists in our top academy in, in America. So when you get really, really into prestigious science, there's an obvious attrition of religious belief. But in our study, we couldn't figure out why. Is it because they only let atheists join? <laughs> or because if, you, if you're really, really into, deep into science, you naturally have to give up all religious belief. We don't know. Little both, we think. Listening tonight has caused me to reflect back on my own education. And the thing I find the most frustrating as I listen is this big, thick, black line of no interaction between the two disciplines. Religion cannot encroach. And let's take it back to what we're talking about in Dover, uh, Pennsylvania. It's a science class. We can't talk about any other subject in science class. Well, I think back to my education. I learned how to read and write in English class. But when I wrote a history paper, I had to use the same grammar and my history report was graded not only on content, but the grammar. In math class, I learned how to add, subtract. But in physics class, I used that math to help me learn. So why, all of a sudden, does science get to say, we can't use any of these other disciplines? Why does science use math, which I understand is a science, but we're talking about high school education? Why are they teaching math in science? Why are they crossing that line? And why do we choose religion as the only one that can't come in? And there are, there are a lot of people who echo that complaint. Why is the, level, the playing field not level? Why is religion treated as the only thing that you have to separate out? It's the nature of our country. Um, the First Amendment, 
some people say it's because we were born out of the religious wars in Europe and we don't want a, you know, a religious war in America. I, I doubt if it will ever happen, but there's too many checks and balances. But this goes right into the high school class, and the lawsuits followed in there. But, but one promising thing is some people are thinking, well, where can you teach this? Um, history of science, which is right in history. You can do it there if the teacher's trained. Kids can take an elective in high school. They usually take PE or basket weaving, but they can take, you know, philosophy of Western civilization or something and learn about the debate on science and religion. Um, and there's more sort of integration of education. My, my, hun, my, my son was in high school three years ago, and uh, history and English worked together, you know. He'd study in history and he'd write the paper in English. And so there is a, what you experience practically. They're trying to do now formally. And maybe someone somewhere can do religion and science, but um, I don't know. Okay. It occurs to me they could. Uh, if they make the simple distinction, perhaps they will in the courtroom, between pattern and purpose. It seems to me that the, the problem seems to be located in trying to find causality behind pattern. Mm -hmm. There may not be. Uh, that can be random. Pattern can emerge without purpose. Um, it seems to me, though, that all of the debate is part of a much bigger cultural divide at this point that's perhaps an echo of it. Um, that's, in effect, focused pretty clearly by Voltaire several centuries ago, at the beginning of all this, long before the Giffords, in a way. Yes. When he said, you know, if God created man in his image, we have more than reciprocated. Yes. In the sense that we've created God very much in terms that we can understand. Yeah. Now, what's at stake is that debate. Is the universe anthropocentric? or not. In other words, does it conform to pattern that we can appropriate and perhaps be on the right side of? Or is it something vastly bigger and beyond any centricity of Homo sapiens? Yes. That is terribly threatening to some people. And in fact, what they're arguing for is not the evolutionary past, but some sort of vision of the future. And this may be the contest that's, that's taking place here. Are we really at the center of something? And we may want to call it intelligence or not. Or is it moving in a direction way beyond us without any particular attention to uh, human need or human um, sort of anxieties or anything? Uh, and it seems to me it's particularly heightened at this point over such things as Himalayas becoming unstable, mm -hmm. tsunamis breaking out, hurricanes at record uh, weight. This, in a sense, is so unsettling to people who don't situate the human within the natural world but want it to be separate from, in a sense, purpose for the natural world. Yes. This is why I think religious folks ought to be exposed to more science because I think there's even tenets in all religions to be cooperative or sensitive to other species, to the natural environment, um, because it might get back on you if you're not sensitive. But it's, it's another layer of human arrogance that we, we uh, could do fine without, I'm sure. I think, I think, let's say, fundamentalist Christians, I think they get a little bit of a bad rap when we say that they think they're the center of the universe and Jesus only came for them, and the whole, you know, billions and billions of other stars in the universe, um, God doesn't even look at them. Uh, I've, I've talked to intellectual fundamentalist Christians who, who say, well, there could be other worlds where God's, you know, working out a plan of redemption. Um, so there's the problem of we have to almost, we have to be um, anthrocentric. We have to see it from the, the human point of view. Um, there, there are more microbes and more insects on this earth you know, times a billion than we are. But will we say, okay, you know, we, we want to give our lives to them? Well, I don't think we'll ever get that human consensus. Um, but the sensitivity to nature, I hope that grows, and I think it's growing, e even with religion, even some fundamental religion. Yes.
I'm here visiting from Germany. Are you talking about an American problem? <laughs> uh, because what you are talking about does not exist in Europe. Well, yes. I, um, uh, the creation-evolution debate is a particularly North American problem. And I say North American because in Canada they had a province that put you know, creation into the biology curriculum, you know, mildly, but uh, wherever there is a, a large enough voting group that worries about teaching their children a literal Bible and that evolution might undercut that, you have the pressure to have this debate. And um, I, I've been to Europe a few times recently, and they'll all tell me there how secular um, Europe is. I think America is going that way too, for better or worse. We hope you, will. <laughs> you hope so? Yes. yes well, um, in one respect, it will bring a little bit more, fewer things to debate, <laughs> and uh, um, fewer things to be overly zealous about. But still, uh, there's a lot of religious people, a lot of s spiritual thought in Europe. Uh, it's not in, in the cathedrals, but it's in the public. I mean, the British. 30% of them believe in ghosts or something like that. It's, you know, um, that's not you know, the trinity, but it's still a, a supernatural kind of thing. So Europe isn't totally blank. No offense, but you know, <laughs> we're not totally crazy and you're not totally blank. So. Okay. Well, in closing, I guess um, the how and the why, thank you for that. Um, it's good to separate science and religion. Let's have good science. Let's have good medicine. Let's heal and end suffering. Let's explore the universe. Uh, but I don't think religion is going to fade away, as a few famous people have said, wither away. And we've got to accommodate it. Um, so let's try to integrate it. Let's confront them uh, personally and uh, socially and Maybe we better stay out of public school.